Hello, my name is Jared Ludlow, Publications Director at the BYU Religious Studies Center, your weekly resource for gospel scholarship. And today we'll talk about some possible resources that can accompany your Come Follow Me study for October 24th through 30th, various chapters from the book of Ezekiel. The first one is an article called Ezekiel, Prophet of Judgment, Prophet of Promise. It's by Gerald Lund, who is a Seminary and Institute Administrator, and it comes from a volume called Isaiah and the Prophets, Inspired Voices from the Old Testament. In this article, Gerald Lund likens the overview of the book of Ezekiel to the question, if you had one hour at Disneyland, would it be more effective to run around to various places as fast as you could and maybe get on one or two rides and then tell somebody all the other things that they could do the next time they go? Or hop on the monorail and spend an hour going around and seeing everything and then knowing what's there so that the next time you go back you can go to those places. And he decides to follow the monorail uh, approach and give just a general overview uh, like a monorail trip so that hopefully once we know the basics of Ezekiel we can go back and find more detailed uh, understanding later. And so he has four orientation points that he emphasizes. Ezekiel the man, Ezekiel the captive, Ezekiel the answerer, and Ezekiel the writer. We don't know a lot about Ezekiel the man, but we do know he was a priest and that he was carried to Babylon from Jerusalem. He was also contemporary with Lehi, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel. And while each of these prophets were from the same time period, they each had kind of different missions. Uh, Lehi, of course, and his family left Jerusalem and escaped Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah remained to witness everything that happened. Daniel was likewise taken to Babylon, but he was in the courts of the Babylonian king. And it's left for Ezekiel, the writer, to uh, talk about some of the things that he has visions of. And so he was called, Ezekiel, to go among the captives and explain to them why this terrible tragedy had happened. Now regarding Ezekiel the captive, uh, Gerald Lund talks a little bit about the historical context and particularly how the captivity and exile were consequences of Israelites breaking the covenant. Ezekiel the answerer relates to basically four questions that Ezekiel will answer in his book. Is Jerusalem really going to be destroyed? If God is really God and the Israelites are his chosen people, why is he allowing this to happen? If the Israelites are being destroyed for being like the other nations, then why aren't the other nations also being destroyed? And what will this tragedy mean for the covenant? So Gerald Lund then goes through the uh, different passages of scripture that help answer these questions. And finally, Ezekiel the writer, uh, Gerald Lund, highlights the organization of Ezekiel's book and how the different prophecies are organized. The second resource is called Approaching Holiness, Sacred Space in Ezekiel's Temple Vision. It's by Jacob Reneker, an independent scholar, uh, and it comes from a Sperry Symposium volume. And he starts off talking about how Latter-day Saints have a very strong temple tradition, and yet we can supplement some of that temple tradition and understanding by examining what non-Latter-day Saint scholars have talked about the nature of temples, particularly in the ancient world. And so in this particular case, he's focusing on scholarship related to Ezekiel's temple vision in chapters 40 through 48. And he highlights that there's two ways that scholars have tried to make sense of the sacred space that Ezekiel describes in his vision. And while these two uh, approaches may seem contradictory, he suggests a way to reconcile these views. And so first off, he gives a summary of Ezekiel's vision, and then he talks about the two views uh, that scholars have come up with to understand this sacred space. One is called the virtual conceptualization of sacred space, and this is looking more at the relationship between the earthly temple and connection with God vertically, and so steps and height, particularly the height of the altar, 
is described that it comes from the bosom of the earth but it reaches up and the horns of the altar are likened to mountains and so vertical conceptualization is this uh, height and uh, direct connection to god whereas horizontal conceptualization of sacred space looks more at progressing from one direction to the other so from east to west going through gates and chambers and eventually into the holy of holies the presence of god and it's likened a lot of times to the garden of eden and how adam and eve were kicked out but then there's this interest and emphasis in returning journeying back into the garden of eden and so the way to reconcile these two approaches uh, he likens to a certain type of statue called the Lamassu statue uh, that was prevalent in Babylonian art. And these statues are of a, a beast figure that when you look from the side, it looks like it's moving. But when you look from the front, it looks like it's standing still. And these are kind of guardian figures, somewhat like the cherubim uh, in the temples. So the idea with these statues is not that you would look from a three-quarter perspective and see both the side and the front at the same time and get confused, because then actually if you count the number of legs, there's five legs, and you're like, well, that's not possible. Uh, but that you would look from one side or the front, and they represent and symbolize different things depending on which perspective you're looking at. And so he likens that to these two perspectives, horizontal or vertical, in this vision. That the idea is not that you try to look at both of them and, and get confused and say, well, they can't be reconciled, and so you just ignore it. But you can look at it from each perspective, see what you might be able to learn from the vertical perspective, where certain passages seem to indicate, you know, this direct connection with God above, or more of this journey, uh, horizontal uh, perspective. And so both can appropriately conceptualize how one may approach God. There's only tension when you try to look uh, at this three-quarter viewpoint, uh, trying to see both at the same time. Uh, and particularly if you start thinking that only one conceptualization can have precedence over the other.